Okay, uh, here for Arrow's Roadmap to Success. Um, so basically, yes, um, I think the big problem that you have is that he just thinks that he's in charge of you due to uh, lack of uh, miscommunications. And so I think probably uh, he's a little under-exercised. He definitely could use some more exercise. So we'll start out there. So basically one of the first things that I usually do is recommend uh, the doggy Stairmaster, uh, which is where you'd get a retractable leash go at your new place, go to the top of the stairs and either have somebody at the bottom of the stairs or you're gonna throw the treats up and down the stairs, but you're throwing them, make sure that he can get them. You don't wanna have them, when th people throw them all the time, they end up like going in a grate or somewhere you can't, and he just spends the whole time digging. So if that's the case, you might just have somebody there or have a, dropping in a bucket or, or a little bowl that he gets. So remember, using fun command words can motivate your dog because they can read facial expressions. So throw it down in the south and then maybe come up with a fun, you know, maybe the, the furthest south place that fish plays and uh, come up with another, you know, maybe call it Anastasio or whatever he comes up the top or Great American or whatever you want. Uh, come up with something that's going to make you guys reson that resonates with you and you're going to laugh and your friends are going to think it's kind of funny. So the idea is the first time we do it, remember he needs to do it with an empty stomach. Dogs can actually rupture their stomach that's full of food when they exercise. Walking is different, but everything else you want to be at 90 minutes after eating before you exercise, especially if there's a lot of lateral movement. So the first time you do it is you go to the top of the stairs with an empty stomach, throw the street, treat downstairs. When he goes down south and gets it, call it Chile. And then call him back up and give him another one, call it Canada. And keep doing that until he's like, I've been there 57 times, not going down anymore. Now you know what the maximum number is for that exercise. I do the same thing with fetch. Um, if he does like the laser later on when he's not preoccupied, maybe you can use that as well. Scent games is another one where you can actually uh, have him in the next room. Hide five treats. Now be careful. I know what you did here with the bully stick and the, and the towel is fine and the blanket is fine. But I see a lot of people like put it on the carpet and the dog digs through the carpet to get to it. We don't want to do that. So really it's just around the corner. And what you do is every time he finds it, say seek or find or you know, hunt or whatever it is. And after a while it becomes a game for him. That's very f stimulating for him as well as physically draining. So once you've figured out what his maximum number is for all these exercises, then what we want to do is we want to exercise him 50 to 75% of those multiple times a day. We don't know how much he needs, uh, and so we're going to base it. We're going to kind of judge his overall behavior. So basically, assign a rating from one to ten. Ten is as crazy excited as you've ever seen him. One is barely above sleeping. So when he's kind of, you guys are wandering around, or you're sitting watching TV, he kind of bounces by. You might say eh, four. And you're like, you're crazy. That's like a seven. You're, it's okay for you to have different scores at first, but by playing this game after a while, you're like six. You're like, yeah, that seems about a six. Once you get to that point, then you can start calibrating. So what you want to do is figure out like when he gets past level five energy, that's when you give him some exercise or he gets a break. He's playing, I know he doesn't play with other dogs, but he gets to that point and once they get to level five energy, remember it's going to take him a lot longer to calm down if we let him go to eight or nine or ten. So I want to practice calming himself down. So basically for the, for the, uh, uh, for the uh, uh, exercise journal, you at, uh, write down basically a new page for each day. Write down the day at the top, write the time, and how long the walk was. I'd like you to continue walking, and those are good for exercise, but I want them supplemented with other things. So they also have two big energy zones, right in the middle in the morning and right in the evening. So if you notice that he, he gets zoomies, we call it running around the room, write down the time for that in your exercise journal as well. The idea is we're going to chronicle this so we have a bunch of data. And so um, you write down the time and the number of repetitions for all these things, but then you also... If he has a barking incident, you write down the time and what he was barking, demand barking, alert barking, or protest barking. And a little bit of what was going on that caused him to do that. Or the construction guys, he barked at the construction guys with the air hammer. So you write down, it didn't have to be a paragraph, but just, you know, barked for you know, two minutes, you know, at the same time they were doing the, uh, you know, the air hammer next door. And so then the end of the day, you give a letter grade A through F. If it's anything other than an A, the next day, you give him more exercise. Instead of doing 25 up-downs on the stairs, maybe you do 35. Or instead of doing the up-downs on the stairs twice a day, maybe you do it three times a day. So the idea is after we keep this for a while, we start looking back at the past. We're like, you know what? Every time it's longer than this duration, that's when he gets the demand, most demand barking. So now let's just back up and let's exercise him multiple times more frequently before he needs to. Let's relieve that pressure. We can also use exercise before a guest comes over. That's a great time to exercise him. Or a lot of people don't really think about this, but exercising your dog before the walk creates a much more enjoyable walk. So you have to play fetch, play fetch for five, 10 minutes, let him calm down, then take him for the walk. And you'll be amazed at how much better the walk goes. 
So the idea is you keep that exercise journal for about two to four weeks and you start kind of dialing down the length of the number of exercises, the number of repetitions, how often you do them until you find that rhythm where you guys can, can divide and conquer and each one of you can do maybe, each one of you does one five minute exercise thing in the house and one of you does two of those a day and one of you and the other two walk the two walks. So each one of you is gonna do two exercise things with the dog every day but we're gonna do it as a team collectively. And that way we can kind of help each other. And you can train it off like, hey, I, I gotta walk him now, but I gotta do this. Can you walk him now? And so on and so forth. Um, so remember, you can set him up for success by exercising him ahead of time before you take him to Disneyland. If you do that again, exercising him beforehand. Um, now, that one you have to be a little bit careful about because he's gonna be not, a, not sleeping at daycare. So I would, if you do take him to daycare there, what I would do is say, can we get him a suite? And he doesn't like dogs, so we just have him hang out by himself and bully stick or something like that. That might make him more amicable to it. Um, the other thing is, again, I would recommend looking uh, for people in Anaheim. There are, I'm sure, a bunch of people on WAGs or different rat apps, or you can just you know, ask your friends that you know, live in the area. You know anybody who watches dogs? And find somebody who doesn't have a dog, who likes dogs, who has good reviews. And a lot of times they have a security camera, so you can watch, check in from Disneyland. And so that way, he, he's not having that negative experience and feel more comfortable. Now, I also went over and showed uh, you guys how to use the martingale collar and the special twist of the leash. That's the part that goes around the chest. Remember, assign the, put the uh, martingale collar with where a leash, att leash attaches to the spine, then run that U-shape around the chest behind both front legs and the back through the loop and always towards the head, never towards the butt. Uh, make sure it's in the armpits and not drifting back here. So um, I have videos on my website for all these things, and so I'm going to say these. I'm going to describe them for you here as well, but uh, some of them, but some of them you'll go look up on my website. So you go to doggoneproblems.com, click on where it says dog training tips. That's where I put all these write-ups. And then on, if you're looking at a desktop on the right side of the page, there's a search box. If you're looking at your phone, it'll be the second field from the bottom. The first lowest field is the, as I have for a newsletter. So basically, uh, search in uh, uh, structured walk is what I call this one. So what I do is the five rules, remember, sign on the right side or left side, whichever side you prefer. Don't worry about traffic or grass or any of that stuff because we're going to take care of that on our own. So rule number one, stay in your position, right or left side. Rule number two, get a flat leash, preferably four foot, straight with no loops or whistles or knots or anything else. And so basically, you uh, run around his chest and have it go straight up to you depending on you guys' height, you might have to wrap it around your palm once, twice. If you're walking like this because a full wrap is a little bit too much, wrap it around two fingers or three fingers or one finger. Come up with the idea is this is the only correction I make, just a very small movement with my arm. So rule number one, stay in your position. Rule number two, keep this arm going straight down. If you're putting tension on it, you're pulling a leash, you're, you're programming and causing the dog to pull against you. So no tension on the leash unless you're correcting. And the correction needs to go up and down that fast as fast as you can going up and down even faster. And so you only want the tension on the leash for a fraction of a second and then you take it off so he doesn't get a chance to pull against it. And you also want to be proemptive about that before he gets in front of you because then he's going to pull against you. And if you're too soft with your corrections, he will just eat you alive and he'll just keep on pulling. I don't want to say he'd be abusive, but you got to give him the right Goldilocks amount so he knows you're serious about it. So um, rule number three is a quick up down for corrections. And again, do it before his chest should never be in front of your torso. Because remember, if he gets too far in front, we try to pull up, you're actually pulling back and that creates more pulling forward. Rule number uh, uh, four is no marking. So pick a spot outside your new place and this is where you pee. And I'm gonna go through your potty training and reminder right here. So pick up a new word for potty, business or whatever it is, but keep it a new word because the words you're using now have certain baggage with it. So whatever you want to use, you could say X, it doesn't have to be anything, but I would come up with something funny like plop or splot or whatever. And so as soon as he starts to pee or poop, say the word business, if that's the word you want to use, and say it in a normal tone of voice, a lot of times you say, business, and the dog will stop peeing and then it will come in and have an accent. So say business in a normal tone of voice, and then when he gets done, crouch down into a squat, that will attract the dog to come to you, give him a treat, and say the word business a second time. Remember, for this and for everything else in your dog's life, always treat first, command word said after. So uh, now you're associating the action with the command word and you're telling him this is the designated area to pee on. The rest of the walk, we do not pee. He can poop if he wants to, but we do not let him mark. Now, don't walk away from things. If there's a fire hydrant, walk as close as you can to it, but don't stop. If you stop, he's gonna guarantee mark it. Walk through it. If he stops, let your arm go limp, but be ready to walk a little faster because you don't want to give him the opportunity to mark. But you want to pass by these things so he learns that I'm not allowed to or supposed to, but if you walk him so far away he can't, 
He's just waiting until you get him closer. So give him the opportunity so he learns now to do it. Um, okay, so that's rule number four, no marking. Rule number five is no stopping and sniffing. So remember, the nose controls 60% of the dog's brain. So if he's sniffing, he cannot stop and sniff, or he cannot pay attention even if you're holding a stake. So we let him sniff as long as he continues to walk. If he stops to sniff, we keep walking, we let our, alarm, let, we let our arm go limp, and it, the leash will eventually get taut and that pulls him. Don't pull him yourself, just let the arm go limp and keep going. After a while, he'll stop doing that quite as much, but he's gonna try to do it now because that's what he's used to doing. He probably stop when he does that. So, um, and then uh, what I remember, use a, a one minute free on each block. So you decide where, and it doesn't have to be the same place each time. You can maybe free here, free there. Um, just basically give him 60 seconds where you undo the part around the chest, keep him on the leash so he's safe, but he can sniff around, he can do what he needs to do. If he's marking a lot in that free zone, I might disagree with the marking with the hissing sound, but uh, usually they're gonna be more sniffing, that's what we want him to do. Um, now if you ever do meet another dog, if there's a dog walking down the sidewalk towards you and, you re and he starts pulling behind, a lot of times we ignore him, like, come on man, I'm in a hurry. Well the dog, he said, I'm scared of that dog. And you're not listening to me. You're forcing, you're pulling me close to that dog. I'm gonna have to, have to pretend I'm really tough and hopefully make that dog go away. So if your dog lags behind, take note of your surroundings. If there's something that he's afraid of and you show him, I, I'm listening. It's irrational what you're doing, but I'm listening and I'll move you further away. And then you can, and then we can let the other dog pass. So I remember anytime he's reactive, the best thing to do is increase distance. Sometimes you have to move around a corner or something before he'll actually settle down. Now, I showed you the focus exercise. Now, for the focus exercise in the pantomime, you're gonna hold your hands like this, make sure your hands look uniform, hold one between your thumb and forefinger and push it against your knee. And as soon as he looks at you, boom, boom. So the, your, the youngest member of your tribe was like. So make sure it's faster, faster uh, at first. And it's one second, one second for all 12 treats. Once he's pretty much just staring at you the whole time, then you go one second, two seconds for all 12 treats. And when you do this, don't just do it right here. Do it there, do it there, do it in the bedrooms, do it in the kitchen, all over the place. They don't generalize well, so you have to help dogs practice in different scenarios. So eventually, within seven days maximum, and you should be able to get here a lot faster than this, but within seven days maximum, you should be able to be at a 15 second second movement. So always to your nose is always only one second. Never stay at your nose. So it's boom, and then whatever the duration is. And count in your head. Um, and make a little chart so everybody's on the same page and you guys are doing it at the same time. So basically, once you get to the point where you're 15 seconds in the house, now you're ready to make it more challenging. Where we do that is right outside your house. And if you do it here, you have kind of the walkway that is outside, but it's not on the street. So that's a great place to practice this again because now there's distractions, which makes it harder. So when we practice outside, you're sitting on steps or whatever, you go back to one, one. Um, and, but you can move faster this time. Maybe you go one, one for five treats, then one, two for five treats, and one, three for five treats. You wanna get within about two, three days maximum where you can have that 15 second movement outside, with there's no, but not with there any distractions. The third stage is when we're walking, and now we're gonna start triggering the command verbally. So when the dog's walking in your position, and there's no one around, and there's no reason to ask for his focus, that's the best time to practice asking for it. So now you say focus, he looks up at you and you go boom, boom, one, one. Give him the treat and then walk a little bit more. And you wanna do that so you get about 10 and, and get to the point where again, you're focus, he looks up at you and you go one, two, three, four. But do this while you're walking. A lot of people like stop when they do this and then the dogs when they're reacting, you want them moving. It's, it's to your advantage to have them you moving. Otherwise they just really dial in and focus. So eventually you get to the point where You've done this and got to the point where you can say 15 seconds while you say focus and he walks into stuff for 15 seconds looking up at you for that treat coming down and you're only doing this when nobody's around, there's no reason to. Once you get to that 15 second focus, and again, this should be about two or three days after you went transition to the, finished doing the outside stuff. Now when you see a dog approaching and you know he pulls behind, you recognize that, you say, oh, focus, he looks up at you because the dog's far enough away, it's not an immediate threat. Then you turn and walk a different direction. You walk down an alley, you walk in the street around a car, something to block his sight, and then just sit there and practice the focus exercise to let that dog pass you. If you get really good at this, a lot of people can say focus. As the dog's walking, he looks up at you, and the tree's going by, and like I talked about just a minute ago, the dog passes you by, before you give the treat, and he doesn't react to the dog at all. Now you can also do other things for his dog reactivity, uh, kind of similar to the clicking exercise I showed you inside. So get a clicker, go to a dog park. Uh, you're gonna be really close to the uh, Strand Street dog park. Go across the street, 
and just sit there waiting and people and people are usually from 4 30 to about 5 30 and 6 that's like happy hour so you just sit outside one of the entrances but far enough away preferably where there's some grass which is going to be easier on the venice side of this in the front on like seventh on the on the uh south on the but you know what I'm saying, uh, the Lincoln and the Venice side of the, the park. And so basically, there's a yard across the street. You want to be preferably where there's some grass, ideally, because it's better than just concrete, which would be on the, on the Palisade side of the park. And so basically what you do is just you have enough distance where he's not barking at the other dogs. He can see them, but he doesn't feel them that would be a threat. And as soon as he looks at the dog, click, looks up at you, and give him a treat and call it like amigos or friendly or doggy buddies, or one word commands, preferably. And so you create a command word, looking at another dog gives me a treat. And the dog is far enough away where I don't perceive to be a threat. And eventually you can move a little bit closer, a little bit closer, a little bit closer. Eventually you might be right by the entrance. And he sees the dog, looks at it, and looks, automatically looks away from the other dog instead of barking because looking at you means I'm gonna get a treat. And also after enough repetition, we're almost programming his brain. The sight of another dog is a positive thing. So instead of reacting to it, I like it. Um, okay, so that's the focus. There's a video on my website for focus. If you forgot how to do that, just and this isn't descriptive enough. Go there and you can watch me do it. I also showed you the hand targeting exercise. I believe you guys were calling it touch. And so um, at first we do it, the member of the progression is, is turn, lean, step, steps. So at first all you want to do is turn his hand to the side. And remember, since he's so used to patty cake games, he's going to revert to that initially. So remember, as soon as the paw comes off the ground, don't wait for his paw to get all the way up here to your hand. When, if this is the floor, this is when you stop and pull away as soon as he starts to put his paw off the ground. And eventually, he's pretty smart, so he got it pretty quickly. But, and then eventually, now you want to chop within about two inches of his face, so he just turns his nose and, and you move. Remember, when you chop, that hand is frozen, move the treat there. And I have videos on the touch. I call it a target exercise, so search for that if you're looking for it. So at first, all he has to do is turn his head to the side and touch, and he gets the treat. Remember, you keep your hand at an angle. If you hold like here, the treat falls right off. And then eventually he leans towards it and eventually takes a step and several steps. And eventually he gets to the point where he can be at the door and he say, touch, and he runs across and touches, and then he pull out the treat and give the treat to here. Um, but make sure to always treat from the other hand. Uh, let me see. Um, we also talk about incorporating some rules. I would suggest going to no furniture for at least 66 days. Really, I'd suggest six, six, six days minimum, but probably as long as the problem is still going on. So it might be three months, four months, or whatever it is. And you might decide after four months, you know, I kind of like not having any dog hair on the couch. You could always go down to his level. So you got pillows here, make a pillow for it, lay on the floor, and you can have a camping, a fish experience um, on the floor with him, but he just can't come to your level. You guys in the VIP section, you can go backstage and meet fish and the rest of the guys. He's wearing, he always wears dresses, right? Yes, uh, and then uh, and then, but they but the general admission can't come to where you are, and that's great. He's he's got a bully stick. Normally he'd be barking at the, at her at that sound, so he's more preoccupied and interested in this than barking at that. So and that's kind of the start of it. Eventually, just we program him so he doesn't even think we need to do that. So um, all right, so uh, and get those X mats. The letter X M A T S. You need probably you can tear them in half. They kind of like a book. You, know, you can fold them on this front. So I'd probably put one, two, then where you're three, four, five, six, seven. Probably you might need eight for that one. They're about eleven to thirteen bucks. If they're more than thirteen bucks, don't buy them. Check on Amazon on Monday. They'll probably be on sale. Or Chewy, everybody does sales and Amazon does sales because they're trying to squeeze everybody out of business. Um, and then that way you put them there so when you're gone, you don't have to worry about it and it takes care of the business. Now at the same time, remember to use this dog bed and throw the treats here to entice them to go here. So the first way is 10 treats for about three days. Throw the treat when he licks it up, island. Throw the treat, licks it up, island. And then after about 10 treats, just wait. If he's not paying attention, leave one there and just observe it. Don't say, don't say there's a treat here. I smell lamb. Goes over and finds it, and then we say island. Or the second way we do it is we, uh, when he comes, oh, we lead him over here and we put him in a sit or an LAY and give him a treat and say island. So you toss, leave, or lure onto it. After about a day or two, he should start hanging out there on his own. So when he goes there, you say the word island, or if you have a treat, throw the treat. And I would recommend getting the, I mind the treat pouch from PetSafe, and you get them on Amazon or Chewy, get the mini one. It's gonna be black and gray at the bottom, um, and you can clip it on your belt. I just I've gone through so many of them. That's by far the best one you get. So that way uh, you come in, and that way you have them with you. If you try to put them in your pocket, you'll forget and you'll wash you on a funky smelling pocket, and or the dog will get it. I'm a bachelor. I'm lazy. I leave it on the floor. The dog eats a hole through my pocket trying to get to him. And now the shirts ruined. So um, after, and I would also you can command him to go there. So 
You can even do a thing like where you have somebody over here with a treat and you get up and take one step towards the door and he sees you and then the person here coughs and then drops the treat. So if actually, when you walk towards the door, you can train him to go there. Or you can walk to the door and just throw the treat here. I don't know what the layout of the new place is going to be like. But you kind of teach him, that when I go to the door, I want you to go here. But try to find a place where you can see the door, but he's far enough, at least seven feet away from it, so that the distance isn't so intense for him, uh, or the person isn't so intense. Um, and rep it. I mean, I would do that. In, remember, when you practice things, practice in, in scenarios where it's practice, it's not the real world. When somebody comes in, that's the worst time to practice this. So every once in a while, it's a commercial break, get up, walk over the door, throw a treat over here, and when he goes over there, knock. You can actually create a knock like we do a counter condition, makes him come all the way over here. So if you practice doing this with you just walking the door, but without the preceding preamble of the knocking, and nobody comes in, and there's no fussling, after you do that enough, you walk to the door, and he just automatically goes here, and come up with a word that means there. I have a lot of clients that call this reservations, like you're at a restaurant, so reservations runs away from the door. And then eventually he runs over there and then you jiggle the handle and then throw the treat. And then you jiggle the deadbolt and throw the treat. And eventually you're opening the door and throwing the treat. And he's been conditioned that this is where I go when there's action at the door. Um, other rules would be, uh, I would say, I don't know what the layout's gonna be in the new place, but right here, um, you have kind of the, the L-shaped couch and there's like a little section with the carpet here. I'd say when anybody's eating here, he's not allowed to be on this carpet. But make sure that he has a path so he can get around it if he wants to. If not, just make sure he's where he's gonna be most comfortable before that person starts to snack. I would also say he's not allowed to be in the kitchen before you, uh, when you're preparing food, the rest of the time he can come and go. Not be allowed around the kitchen table when we're, preparing, when we're eating food, the rest of the time he can come and go. I usually like to do a setup for this. Uh, I like to say, joking, there's no entrapment laws for dogs. So what I do is I create a scenario where I can help the dog practice what I want. So I go into the kitchen, and instead of actually cooking, when I'm cooking, I'm distracted. So what I do instead is I go to the kitchen, and I walk towards him using those escalated consequences, make sure he's outside the line. Now once he's across the line, stop. Wait for him to be stationary. When he is, take a left foot, right foot back, and make him kind of big steps. If you do small, it'll take you forever. And like I was having you do at the door, you take a step back, and he's going to come forward. You hiss and rush forward. But only when he crosses the line. So you might have to put painter's tape down so you know exactly where that line is. So you're going to go, you feel like a waltz. You're going back and forth, back and forth. But remember, every time you step back, you wait for him to be stationary before you take another step back. And at first, you only take one step, and you have to go forward and back and forth. Eventually, he sits or lies down. Then you take another step backwards. He stays in put, another step backward. Then what I do is I take a piece of bacon, and I microwave it. And then I pull it out of the, and I'm keeping my hips pointed to him the whole time. Remember, your, your authority goes wherever direction your hips are pointing. So eventually I back up and I'm to where the microwave is, but I keep my hips pointed at him. I'm grabbing stuff, keeping my hips pointed. And I pull it out and put it on the counter. And then I start pulling out the food that I'm about to prep, the bread, uh, the skillets. I'm banging pots around, opening up. It sure, looked, it sure smells like I'm cooking. It sure looks like I'm cooking. But instead of cooking, you're watching him out of the corner of your eye. And as soon as he crossed the threshold, you rush towards him like he stole something. And after a while, he's like, man, black shirt man came. And he just sees everything now. And he'll sit or lie down outside the boundary. When he sits or lies down, then you can start your actual cooking. And he doesn't see any distinction. So you did a warm-up session. And instead of you being distracted, you made it look like you're distracted to help him practice. And as soon as he broke the rule, you were on him like white on rice. No pun intended. And then when you go back and then back and forth, and eventually he just learns when I'm in the kitchen, they're in the kitchen, I'm just not allowed in there. I can go in there and the rest of the time, they're not going to yell at me, but boy, are they going to correct me right away and move, make me move out of that kitchen. Do the same thing with your kitchen table. Do the same thing with her. When she's having a snack, arrange to have you in here, one of you in here, so you can practice doing this while she's having her snack. Practical applications like that are easy. When you have a guest, that's when we don't want to practice and teach the dog during the real world situation. But this, we're already teaching them how to do it. This is just an extrapolation to it. Um, okay, so um, also eating. Oh, I thought he was almost done with that. No, he's not. Um, so it's important that he eats after you guys do. So put food down in the bowl, and then don't let him eat it like you do now. Then whoever's feeding him gets a chip or cracker, something to eat in five more bites. Then you give him permission to eat. And when he takes his first bite of food, use that uh, passive training. Say peace or tacos or whatever the word is that you want to use for his word to eat. So for three months, every time he takes that first bite of food, you say chimichanga. And after a while, chimichanga is his command word to eat. Um, and again, when he drinks water, I would say agua or cocktail or happy hour or vino or whatever you want to say, uh, just to get him command. And again, he doesn't need to know how to drink, but teaching him to do it on command can be very helpful. Um, all right, so um, uh, that's a really important one, and it'll take him a couple days. He will probably not want to eat, or he might protest a little bit. That's fine. 
And remember, every anytime he doesn't eat, you pick up the food, dump it empty, and put the empty bowl back down. So he doesn't, uh, he, if you take the whole bowl away, it looks as you take his food away. If you dump it and put an empty bowl back down, he recognizes the bowl is empty. It's a different state. And then when there's food there, it's a very valuable, important time. Um, also, I make the dog sit before I go to the door. Go to the door, say sit once. If he doesn't sit within three seconds, drop the leash, walk away, sit down. Remember, playing hard to get works great. So I'd like you to get in the habit of only saying the command word to your dog for one anything for once. And then after, if he doesn't do it, then he's going to have to wait. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you. Um, he's going to have to wait for one minute before you give him another opportunity. And if he doesn't do it within three seconds that time, you walk away for two minutes. Next time, we'll walk away for four minutes and for eight minutes. You keep doubling the length of time till eventually when I go to the door and say, sit. Actually, what will happen is he'll go sit at the door with his way of saying, I'd like to go outside, please. Now, when you go to the door, I have videos that show you how to teach the dog to go stay out, uh, to not go through the door like I was showing you there. And it's, it takes a lot of patience the first couple times. When you're in a hurry, don't try to do a pen. The bet, one of the secrets is this, do this at times where you're not even planning on taking for a walk. That ruins the classical conditioning, it kind of desensitizes them. So practice them every couple times and then every once in a while, oh, we are walking. Um, okay, um, let me think, what else? I think that's it for rules, but also look for ways to delay gratification. When you're playing fetch, make him sit and, and stay before you pick it up and throw it. Uh, whenever, when I say fetch, play fetch, I say it three times. Fetch as I throw it, fetch when the dog picks it up, and fetch when I give it a treat. And never pull the object out of his mouth. Now, you asked me a little bit about resource guarding, which he may have some resource guarding. He may just be growling, hey, you're too close to me when I'm eating, which is appropriate. And before we go, uh, finish that, I'd like you to go get an Omega treat ball. It's Omega toy, I think is, it's an orange ball. Go to Amazon, just search for Omega, you'll find it. Amazon Chewy, you should be able to find them there. Get the large one, and uh, you can put his food in there, maybe feed him out of that for breakfast. So put it in there, and then you guys eat something first, and then put the ball down and nudge it a little bit. The first couple times, do it when you're here, so you might have to nudge it for him a couple times. But eventually he nudges it around, he has to work for his food, which actually boosts his self-esteem. Um, let me see, what else? Um, all right, uh, so we went over petting with a purpose and passive training. Petting with a purpose is if he demands attention from you or demand barks at you, give him a counter order. Tell him to sit. Now, if he's demand barking, I would actually make him do two things before he sit. But if he just nudges you or paws at you, tell him to sit. And when he sits, then pet him under his chin and say the word sit and only the word sit. And then you can pet him as much or as little as you want. You have to pet him at least once to as many times as you want. And so what he's gonna learn is I have to go and sit in front of you to ask for the attention. Sitting is more subordinate, so it's a way of saying please. And so what'll happen, he'll start coming and sitting in front of you to prepay for the attention. When he does, make sure we do recognize and reward that. Remember, try to pet him under his chin, try to avoid patting on top of the head, because that creates a down nose orientation. This is a great way to have a nose up. You can scratch his butt, pet him anywhere you want, except for reaching over or patting his head. Uh, and say just the command word, not good sit, just sit. Come with a list of the official command words, put them on the fridge or somewhere else, and if somebody says the wrong word, you say vocabulary. For petting with a purpose, if I suspect someone's petting without a purpose, I say, I say paycheck. That person has to stop petting, even if they did it the right way. Tells the dog to sit, and the dog sits within three seconds, they pet on the chin and say, I actually asked the dog to sit, you just missed it, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but if you argue about it, it the dog thinks, oh, I don't have to do it. Um, and uh, even if you want to pet the dog, you should still ask the dog to sit. That way the dog is earning that affection as opposed to just giving the affection. Remember, if you do this, every time you pet your dog, it boosts its confidence, it increases its respect for you as an authority figure, and it helps it practice the behavior. Now, that will transition towards the dog starting to pre pro offer or prepay for those things with the behavior they want. When it starts doing that, make sure you recognize or reward that, and that's what I call passive training. Passive training, you do it for other things as well. Passive training, every time he brings you the duck, call it you know, Daffy. Every time he brings a blue thing, call it a Smurf stick or something like that. Name all your individual toys, which I think you guys already have. Um, but also weird things. I taught my dog to stretch. Every time he'd stretch, which I would probably do that for your dog because stretching is a play bow. And that's a way of telling the other dog, you can, I want to invite you to play with me. So if he's kind of beefing at another dog and you can train him to stretch on command and the other dog's kind of beefing back, the other dog's like, oh, I read that wrong. You, want, you just wants to play. Because dogs do a play fighting. It's fighting, but it looks like play. So it's very easy for things to transition one way or the other. And so you can just, even if you don't do the play, but he does that a couple times, like, oh, I read that wrong. He wants to play with me. And you know, then you walk by, but at least they're not reacting to each other. So um, I taught my dog to stretch that way. If he does anything unusual, I don't, and one of my dog grumbles, and I petted him when he grumbles. And so you can come up with these funny commands for whatever it is. 
Um, so that's petty with a purpose and passive training. Um, I say uh, testify if I think somebody is missing out on an opportunity to, to uh, passively train their dog. Um, and it's really an observation game. It takes, it's, passive training is slower, but it's really effective if you're getting in a habit of it. And it'll take you guys about two months to get in a habit of it. I would recommend that you guys are super duper strict and militant, militant about all this stuff for about two months, maybe two and a half months. After that, you can kind of start slacking off and the dog's kind of got it established. Now remember, when you're training a dog, at that point we give it a lot of freeway, and maybe it only does one of the moves, we would pay it for it, we just wouldn't say the command word until they're doing the whole thing. But once they know it, that's when we would be strict. Most people do a half-hearted job, part of the, uh, the beginning, and then they, uh, I usually say half-assed, and then they do the other cheek the rest of the dog's life. I want you to be too cheeky to begin with and then have to do no cheeks later on. Um, all right, um, let me think, what else? Uh, the escalating consequences, hiss, stand up, march, leash, uh, well, I didn't even talk about leash timeout. If you wanna watch video, you can come on in. Um, uh, yeah, it's just for you guys, No, it's not a big deal. Um, so if there is, uh, if you wanna watch that, go to Dog uh, Problems and click on uh, Dog Training Tips and type in escalating consequences. Um, it'll have that up there. Um, and I do have one with the leash, you can hear about it. I don't think you guys need it, that's why I didn't go over it with you. Um, let me think what else. Um, I think that's just about it. Is there anything else we want to cover? I think the counter conditioning, I went over pretty in depth in the video above, so it's going to take a little bit of practice, but make yourself that list and go through it one at a time and just work on one or two of them at a time. Don't try to do 10 at once. You won't feel like you made progress. Get one or two done and get it done and know that you're done and then move on to the next thing. Otherwise, you just get frustrated. Um, also, when you're teaching him stuff, Make sure that if you get frustrated or he gets frustrated, you stop. You always want to stop on a good one. Training is ideally done about in a 90-second training segment. Uh, a lot of times you push past two minutes, you start getting failures, and then you start getting frustrated, or the dog gets frustrated, and the last thing the dog remembers, last time you did it, you get all pissy that I wasn't doing whatever it was. I don't want to do that. You're going to get pissed off again. So that's why you want to keep it short. And the last time the dog does it, it gets a good one. And if it was getting, you were a little frustrated, or the dog's getting a little frustrated, make sure you pet the dog after it gives them belly rubs, play a little game, play a little fetch. So the last thing, oh, we did a little work and we had a great time afterwards. Um, and then, yeah, I would also, uh, for just for the vets, nothing wrong with VCA other than I just find that they, a lot of times their motivation is more getting money out of you. Um, and I'm, I'm sure they love your dogs as well, but I would rather have one vet that is familiar with my dog that I see every single time. And uh, so you know, that's saying that you can't have any, any antlers or stuff because he had a cracked tooth. Uh, well, he might have been super duper stressed when that was the case. So remember, our goal is to remove stress, but chewing is a way that they do channel and release a lot of stress. So we don't give him an, an opportunity to do it, something that's healthy, then often it manifests in barking or marking or chewing or other destructive behaviors. So the bully sticks, I think, is a good compromise because it's not too hard. Um, and again, I would just find a new vet, put it on YouTube or uh, Facebook and get some recommendations. T try out a couple of vets. Find somebody that resonates with you. You feel good about this person. Maybe he's, he hates fish. Well, then we're not gonna go with that guy. And so, or girl. And so we wanna find somebody that is just gonna be familiar with your dog and your dog, make it a good experience. Does your dog like the vet? So that's real easy to fix. So when you find your new vet, um, I would just take him in there. First five times you go in there, no checkup. Go in there, get the high, get these you know, lamb treats or whatever it is, some super duper high value treats, and then go in there. And if you want to set him up for success, I would maybe uh, have one of you go in there, get in the car, and drop one of you off, and the other, you run around the block with him, and then you go in there, and preferably there's dogs here, make a little trail. So and he gets in the parking lot. He doesn't know what it's a vet clinic. Most dogs don't like the vet because you think about it, if we go to the doctor, they're usually doing things to us we would probably rather they don't do. And we're not really in the best mood when we go see the doctor. So you combine those two things, that's really not a very good experience. Well, we can easily flip that and make it a positive experience. So now we go to this new parking lot I've never been before. I get out of the car and look, there's a treat there. And I take, oh, there's another treat there. And another, now I'm in air conditioning and there's treats galore. And now I meet this person in white and they gave me a treat. And this girl gave me a blue a treat and this person gave me a treat. You know, treat, treat, treat. In this room, I get a treat. I go on the scale. There's treats there. And then we leave. Nobody stuck their finger in my butt. Nobody did anything negative. No shots. And then, and that's the other reason you want to find a vet that's relatively close by so it's convenient for you. And then go back in there. And uh, another, If you do this right, your dog will like going to the vet's office. And you do like about five or six visits. And he should meet your actual vet. And have your vet 
uh, especially if he's particular about being uh, petted in a certain place, you have to give your vet just have you know the, the pouch and be like, hey doc, here's a whole bunch of vet treats. Just the psychologist we talked to said just if uh, first couple times you touch him, give him a treat and then touch. Or if the doctor is doesn't want to do that or is doing other things while he is examining your dog, just be giving him the treats while it, that works just as well. So you want to look at my private parts as you're giving me lab. Sure, go ahead, knock yourself here. I'll lift my leg up, make it easy for you. Uh, but if you do that right, the dog actually likes going to the vet, and then you don't have all the stress, and it's easier for the vet office, and it's easier for you guys. You don't have all the production stuff that you're dealing with now. Um, all right, anything else? Uh, remember for uh, for uh, Hannah. Now Maddie. He, now he's messing with me. I, I knew it was M. Uh, but for Maddie, remember, you can also do that counter conditioning. So again, set it up. Um, oh, I didn't talk about the treat thing, so I'm glad I remembered. So remember the treat thing, a couple of things. This is an attention game. So you have your clicker. And make sure you prime the clicker. So um, tomorrow, get a clicker tomorrow, order on Amazon Prime. And then uh, basically tomorrow, uh, throw about 10 treats down the ground, click every time he gets a click, uh, treat, and never click at him like for attention. The click is to indicate you just did exactly what I want. I'm now going to get a treat in your mouth as fast as I can. And after the treat goes in, you're going to mark it with your command word. So the focus game, or not the focus game, but really the attention game, you're just going to throw the treat in the house. He goes over and gets it, and you're watching him with the clicker. As soon as he looks at you, you click, and then give him the treat and say attention. You can do the same thing with her and call her, I can't remember what the name is, whatever her nickname is, uh, every time he looks at her. And that's one where you're just watching TV and she's sitting here. And as soon as he looks at her, click and give him a treat and then say whatever the name is. And eventually you can do it where she's sitting there and you're over here with him. And again, have some distance and then have her and then just do the same thing. So give him a treat and then have her stand up and then sit back down. And do that about three to five times in a row. Then have her stand up and then if he doesn't work, give him the treat. And after a while, she gets up and takes a step and then backs up and sits down. And you break it down to visual. But then eventually she can come around the corner, she can close the door, she can do all these things. And instead of him thinking it's a negative I don't bark at, I think it's a good thing. Now I do this outside, I go to an area where I know the dog's gonna be distracted, but I start off with just right outside the door, the easiest portion of outside. And I just stand there. As soon as the dog looks at me, click and give it a treat. And then take a two or three steps, stop, as soon as he sniffs around, so he looks up, click, treat. And you want to do a very easy situations. That's why I like to do it in the house first. And then eventually you're doing it in your courtyard. Then you're doing walks with nobody around. But then he's just getting in the habit of checking in and looking in with you. Because normally he's looking for everything but you. And visuals get dogs into trouble. So if you can get him and you also now are assigning attention. So you say, now you can say attention. You can say focus. You can say touch. You, now we have multiple things that we can do to get the dog's attention. Now, depending on the situation, you might notice that certain activities work better than others and just use whatever works best. Uh, but the idea is we want to establish the behavior pattern. He's not going to just look because he's looked at you 10 times. You have to do this a whole bunch so that he's just, the new pattern is I just look and check in with you every couple seconds because good things happen. And then he's not going to spend so much time staring at another dog or whatever it is. But remember, if you are on a walk and he lags behind you, take note of your environment. And if there's something wrong, and also, uh, well, one last thing I'll tell you about is, is stuff, but if you notice his body language tells you he's, in, he's insecure, moving him away from it and then practicing the focus exercise is great. Now, when he is in a good mood and you know that he's amicable, he's feeling great about himself, look at his ears, look at his overall body posture and his tail. When he is scared, look at those same things. When he's another dog's around. The more that you learn to read his body language, the better prepared you're going to be able to get him out of situations. When dogs are reacting, it's often that they have worked themselves up into a frenzy. That's level 8, 9, or 10. But if you can recognize his warning signals, oh, he lowered his head, he stopped breathing, he turned his head to the side and a lot of white in his eye, he's getting ready to bark. Hey, buddy, come here. Focus, focus, focus. Now you're redirecting him away from it. And the, the, the faster you get him away from that without letting him spiral all the way up, the easier and the quicker it's going to be to relax him. If you don't, otherwise he's going to be a bad, uh, he's, I don't know if going to say a bad word, it's public or private just for you guys anyways. But again, he's going to be a basket case. We want him just to learn to focus and look to us. We got your back. We're going to put you in a safe situation. Just give us your confidence and we're going to make the world sing for you. After a while, he's just, he doesn't have to feel all the pressure. And the demand barking, like I said, you can use those uh, negative punishment, uh, which is to leave the room. If you're going to do that, first bark, leave the room. And close the door behind you and wait for at least three seconds of no barking before you come back out. And then ignore him. And if he comes back up to you, tell him to sit or do something in your own app. But that's what goes back to the petting with a purpose. All right, now, um, this is not, new, not doing a write-up. This is going to be on YouTube. It's just for you guys. So I recommend that you guys watch this like once a week. 
uh, for the first four weeks and then come back and watch about every two weeks till you get to a point where you watch it and you're like, man, we got all this. There's, we got all this down and the problems are gone or we've just mastered these exercises. Um, the last little note I'll give you is because he is a, such a smart dog, training and behavior are separate, but there are some passovers. So things that require control is great for helping him develop control and not barking at people in other situations. My puppy class instructor, Taylor, she teaches your dog to have a, paw, a treat on both paws and have to wait for permission before I can eat it. And she says right or left, and it has to wait for the right or left to eat it. The stay is a wonderful way to develop self-control. Most people treat their dog to stay for duration, distance, and distractions all at once. I do it for duration only. Stay, and I has to stay, and I don't move on to duration until I can stay right a foot in front of me for up to five minutes, five times in a row. Only then do I go start adding in distance. Most people try to do all three at once. And if you do want to teach stay, I would recommend you go to my website or just message me and I can send you a link to it because the way I teach it is makes it a lot easier. A lot of people try to do it all at once or they teach the dog what we call an auto-release. Um, but yeah, besides that, I mean, he's a great little dog. I mean, he's quite a bit of a barker, but I think if you guys work on this stuff, build up his confidence, help him see you guys as leaders, come up with all these different ways to redirect his attention and create a healthy leader follower dynamic, as well as the clicking, I guess that's the last, last thing. Um, so remember when he's barking, bark, bark, bark. Now you can do it, you can click for each bark, but if he's demand barking, that's one that I might not want to do. Uh, but if he's barking at dogs or whatever, go to a place where he's going to bark at dogs and just sit there and he barks, click, treat, speak. Click, treat, speak. Now once you get to the point where he can bark on command, even no, even not, you can do it the other way, is he's bark, 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 bark. Three seconds, click, treat him. Now first it might be one second of pause, click, and then treat him. That one can get a little bit dicey. You want to start elongating that, but eventually two seconds, three seconds, four seconds. So he's silent for three seconds, then we click, we give him the treat, and we say, what did you say? I want to say quiet. Quiet. And so and then eventually long, elongate it. You want to get to the point where you say, speak and buff! Silent, quiet, treat. So he's getting a treat for speaking and a treat. You know, so turning it on, is, it's easier to teach off if you've taught on first. All right, anything else? I think that's it. All right, so uh, remember, everything you do trains your dog. Only sometimes you mean it.